Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Magic of World Building panel. I'm Zoraida Cordova. And I'm Danielle Clayton. And today we are going to be talking about all things magic, but we have a podcast called Deadline City. And so we thought we would do this Deadline City style, which means that Zaretta and I are going to put the three of you in the hot seat and also um, talk together and have a discussion about all things world building. It's a little bit early <laughs> on the East Coast for <laughs> us writers. So and the, I know. So I'm, and right. I'm hoping that everyone is sort of excited and ready to dive in. And we'll let each of you introduce yourself and your most latest work that you're going to be talking about. All right, Rebecca, can you go first, please? Yes, so hi, I'm Rebecca Ross. I'm the author of the Queen's Rising duology, and my most recent work is Sisters of Sword and Song. It just came out this past June. It's a story of two sisters, one who commits a crime and the other who decides to step up and help carry her punishment. Um, but as they both begin to uh, carry out the sentence for it, they realize there are secrets or secrets comes to the light. So um, it's a young adult fantasy standalone inspired by ancient Greece. Amazing. Uh, Adrian? Hello, uh, I'm Adrian Tchaikovsky. I'm a British fantasy and science fiction writer. I'm probably best known at the moment for uh, Children of Time, which is my big novel about giant spiders in outer space. Um, this is my uh, most recent one, Doors of Eden. It's about parallel timelines, speculative evolution, and sort of colliding worlds. Perfect. And Christopher, round us uh, up. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Christopher Paolini. Uh, I'm probably best known for uh, Aragon and the other novels of the Inheritance Cycle. And I have a new novel coming out in September, September 15th, which is To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. And it's this massive uh, brick of a book that hopefully readers are going to enjoy. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much for, one, submitting to this sort of co-moderating situation. Um, and if people are watching and they don't know me, my name is Danielle Clayton. I am the author of the Bell series, um, and I run a fabulous podcast with Zoraida. And I'm Zoraida, and I am probably best known for the Brooklyn Bruja series, which is Witches in Brooklyn, and they are Latinas. <laughs> so <laughs> it's an easy, it's an easy pitch. All right, so world building, let's get to it. First question, if you only had three ingredients to make a world, you get three things in your <laughs> toolbox. What are those three ingredients that make a world? These are ingredients that you use for your worlds or ones that you might admire in other worlds? I want to know, what do you have? Rebecca, can you start us off? Yeah, so it's interesting because now that I've had my third book published, I've begun to see this um, certain themes kind of are reoccurring in my work. Um, so one of them is definitely like education and school. There's always like some type of school or university um, in the books that I create. So I definitely would probably throw in um, education. I also really love when fantasy books focus on the food. Um, and this is something like, I feel like I'm having like to get better at, but one of my favorite fantasies is Woven in Moonlight by Isabel Ibanez. And she really brings in just like the food in this fantasy book. Like you can't read it and not get hungry and you like want her to cook these foods for you. So um, I always love like the food lore in fantasy books. I think maybe the third one, maybe, um, I don't know, the flora and the fauna, maybe like I, I'm pretty descriptive. So I like to like describe settings. Um, so I think it'd be kind of hard for me not to kind of have like the, uh, you know, the description of like the wildlife and, and the, the terrain. So <laughs> Amazing. Great. Uh, Christopher, what about you? Give me those ingredients. Uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat and <laughs> choose, choose, I'm gonna choose some really broad categories because I, I I think to ignore any one of them would cause me problems. Uh, so the first one would be technology, and you could include magic within technology, but technology, uh, culture. And the great thing of saying culture is it includes everything from religion to, uh, you know, education to uh, the, the the finer details of fashion. Uh, sorry, my cat is biting my ankle at the moment. 
and the cat has world building feelings so and, and then lastly the world itself and that could include everything from uh, the biology of the creatures oh this is kiara the cat um the biology of the creatures to the landscape and with those three major elements i feel like i would have a complete setting and a complete world okay adrian well um i I think I would need an idea of deep time. Uh, I would need to feel that the world I was building had it very, very deep roots and went back a long way. I mean, whether it's an evolutionary thing or whether it's purely a, a cultural thing, the idea that there are things to be discovered that go back into the mist of time or things that will never be discovered because those mists obscure them. Um, I think I would also want the idea of... Um, Characters in a book, especially characters in the fantasy book who are trying to work out how the world, their world works. Um, I really enjoy when I see it. I mean, um, N.K. Jemison does it in the fifth season. And Jen Williams does it in her most recent books. And it's really the idea, just because you've got a world with magic and dragons or whatever you've got in it, doesn't mean that it, it just does whatever it needs to do. The, the, the idea that there is an underlying structure that is actually that inquiring minds in the setting can puzzle out is always very attractive. But the big thing that all of my books seem to do, fantasy or science fiction, is, is the relationship between people and nature. There's always some sort of, whether it's people turning into animals or animals that have been engineered into people or people with insect powers or whatever, there's always something like that where there is that collision between the human and the natural world that I seem to always be drawn back to. And that's amazing. And Zoraida, you have to answer that question too, because uh, <laughs> I'm making you do that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I, I would go, I am a product of the 1990s YA fantasy, uh, supernatural vampire books, right? Amelia at Water Roads, Vivian Vandeveld, all of those. So I think that uh, for me, it's always, it's always some sort of nightclub and uh, like magical underworld society, underground society, specifically since my stuff is in Brooklyn. Um, religion, I like making up religions, uh, and figuring out how people interact. Um, and I would go to this idea of home uh, because home is very, very specific. And I think you get a lot of the texture of the world building when you're describing things. How do people, is it a sacred space? Is it a communal space? Um, do people take their shoes off when they enter the home? That indicates culture. Um, a lot of things like that, uh, I think, are really, really uh, hit hit home for me. Oh, home. yeah. Actually, uh, I, I had a question for everyone, if that's okay. Sure. Okay. Um, I was just kind of wondering uh, if any of you use art as part of your world building process, whether to draw maps or sketch characters or technology or anything like that. I've, I found it a very useful part of my process, and I was wondering if that was something any of you have used. I definitely draw out a map before. Sometimes it helps solidify my world. In my book, Labyrinth Lost, it's sort of this journey through this other, other world. And um, when I knew it's, it's like a descent into hell, uh, and every challenge is, or, or a Super Mario video game, so they're like next level, level, level. Uh, and that helped me solidify what the world actually looked like, was drawing it out. Hmm. I, I use the map, Danielle, too. you have maps. Yeah. I definitely, I'm a terrible illustrator, but I like to take um, images of other maps. And so in my World of the Bells, it's um, an archipelago. So I try to look at other also island-based countries, closed kingdoms, things like that. And I looked at a lot of different maps um, from various time periods as I was sort of trying to make my own map. I'm a terrible illustrator. However, I think trying to figure out where things are, why they're there, um, what kinds of uh, landscapes influence culture and how that influences culture from the actual terrain, what grows there, which means what, what linked to what kind of food. I think starting with the map for me really helped me pin down some of those world building details. Rebecca, what about you? Did you make a map? Did you... I definitely, yeah, I definitely do a map um, just because I feel like I need to know like where everything is as well. Um, I'm not, I'm also not that much of an artist, but I love to do a Pinterest board. So I'll kind of gather mm -hmm. um, visual because I'm very visual. So I'll kind of gather these visuals together and kind of make a mood or a vibe that kind of helps me kind of direct me when I'm writing. What about you, Adrian? 
Um, I, for fantasy books, for the big fantasy books, uh, fantasy series, I've certainly done maps and that's, that's more, that's not so much a world building thing It's purely a practical, I literally need to know where things are and what direction you're going from X to Y and so forth. Um, but I do, I also tend to do a lot of character sketches and creature sketches and, uh, spaceships and all that sort of thing, just so, because otherwise I find my visualization of characters will tend to drift from section to section if I'm not careful. So having that kind of, like, kind of, um, rough and ready, you know, this character has this shape of face and this is the sort of clothes they would normally wear and things like that. Is it just a useful mnemonic when you come back to that set of characters? Awesome. Um, so speaking of character, what comes first for you, uh, character or the world? I feel like this is a contentious question because there are yeah. like different factions and camps that writers like fall into. And I get really aggressively angry about this. So I can't wait to see what, <laughs> what camp everyone's in so that then I can like complain. So um, uh, Rebecca, where are you at? Like, it's you only get one team it's team world or team character pick one join okay. your faction okay um i'm definitely team character i think it's because i am so much a discovery writer um that typically like when i'm first starting out i don't really know everything about the world yet and if i tried to sit down and like plan out everything of the world i would probably never write the story because i would just stay creating the world the whole time so um, I tend to write more character driven stories too. So I just really need to be kind of, you know, solidly with this one character that's going to kind of spark everything. And then things just kind of, I discover as I go. So I just have to have the character. Fine. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to me, I'd say this almost seems like the genre equivalent of the old argument of whether a story should be character driven or plot driven. Mm -hmm. And my answer to the question in this case is the same as it would be for character versus plot, which is that it doesn't matter to me which side of the equation you start on. If you're being honest about, um, if you're being honest about the process, then you should end up in the same place. So if you start as someone who concentrates on the world building, then you still need characters to care about. And those characters will be shaped by the world. And if it's a big epic story, they might be shaping the world in turn. And if you start with the characters, you still need to think about the world they inhabit, and you're still going to have to do your world building one way or another. So ultimately, I feel like I would end up in the same place. I know as I'm creating characters, thinking about the world they inhabit and how that would shape them has a major influence on the story and the characters. And then thinking about the characters tends to influence the world as well. And thinking about, as Adrian said, how would these people be investigating their circumstances? Where's that going to lead them? And so forth and so on. So I'd say I'm about smack dab in the middle. Hey, uh, how is that fair <laughs> to be the, on the fence? <laughs> so basically, you're not joining a team. You're in the middle. You're like, I'm going to watch the two factions fight. Fine. Exactly. Fine. <laughs> um, well, Adrian, I, where are you? Um, I complete the spectrum. So I am absolutely and unapologetically world first. Wow. Yes. Yes. Um, I mean, very <laughs> specifically, I, I always feel I'm telling stories about the worlds for me and I start I always spend a fair amount of time working out how the world works and I mean for example especially with with sci-fi and fantasy but I think it, it's it's actually more key in the fantasy I'm usually writing about a world and a setting where there is a very explicit and upfront difference so in the um in the echoes of the fall everyone is a shapeshifter it's not just there are a world and in this world there are some werewolves it's literally everyone does this and that means the whole world becomes very different um the knock on I, basically it's like setting up setting up dominoes and letting the dominoes fall and then everything changes everything else and it's all all of those knock-on differences are what makes the world fascinating to me so what what you know what what advantages do you get from this what do you not need to do what do you do how did it change the way you look at the world how did it change your uh spiritual beliefs all of these all of these things sort of grow organically out of the basic uh choices i've made uh at that beginning and then the characters and indeed the plots arise quite naturally from well, who are the people in the world? What are the stress points that this situation has created? Where, you know, what, what do people fight about? What do people, um, 
where does the drama come from in the world? And, it, I, and thus far, that's always kind of made itself apparent once I've done a good enough job of setting the world in motion. I love that because I'm also a world person if you haven't figured that out. And I love to build worlds and figure out sort of all of the nitty gritty. What are the bones of the world and how do we complicate it and how do we break those bones and how do we like get things going? And then I find my troublemaker in the world. So (laughs) I just, I'm just a bully and I just want everyone on my team because it's a fun team to build a world and think about like, how does how do we get news in this world? That's my obsession. Zoraida bullies me, but I'm always I looking for like the, yes, you do about like where are the newspapers? If there's a newspaper, or how does news spread? I have weird obsessions with post office and the post. So in my world, you get a lot of that, and so I just like to bring everyone over to my team. But yeah, that's just I mean we talked about we've talked about this on Deadline City where I am a true like I see a person. And then they fall, the world falls around them. I try to figure out what they need, how they travel through the world, how they shape the world, how the world shapes them. And then, then I get all of those answers. So I think that I, I definitely, but I definitely have to see this, this, this being uh, in order for me to start and then know that this is the person who I'm going to tell a story about. I think for my for me, I, I need to have some idea of the sort of story I want to tell, and then that gives me the reason to develop the world. Uh, and of course, in developing the world, it usually massively influences the story. But without that key inspiration, I, I'm, I feel like I'm just moving pieces around on a on a on a board and just kind of um, building building like an RPG style game without any reason for doing so. Don't you want to be a demigod, Christopher? Don't you want to be a demigod? Join I, I, Adrian and I in the land of the demigods. It's amazing. <laughs> I feel I like already we have. Am. <laughs> Haven't you seen the beard? <laughs> <laughs> we are. Uh, we are. I feel like we're a perfect world building seesaw because uh, Christopher's in the middle, and then we have two on each side. Yeah, it's fine. Adrian and I. He's got the better accent. We win. <laughs> so just saying. Um, my, we're, our world is better. Um, but I think it's time to put everyone in the hot seat and ask everyone an individual question. So what we love to do, warm you up. We talk generally. And now we're going to do sort of a deep dive into your individual world um, and the work that you're working on right now. So Rebecca, you get to get in this hot seat first. <laughs> <All right>. um, <laughs> And we were wondering, looking at your work and thinking about it, sort of the inspiration wells that you're drawing from. We're seeing a lot of sort of ancient classical inspiration, the Greeks. Um, But I wanted you to talk about the analogs that you're using in this current work and do you, how you pull or might pull from actual living cultures to build into a fictional landscape. Give us your secret sauce of how you do that, or if you do that, are we wrong here? Yes. So I think, again, kind of going back to how, um, like, the beginning, I I have to kind of see a character. So with Sisters of Sword and Song, um, it actually came from two different ideas. So the first idea was the story of these two sisters. Um, The older sister commits a crime, and the younger sister decides to take part of her sister's punishment. And so I tried to write it. Uh, several times, and it just kept fizzling out. I wasn't sure what I was missing. Um, And so then I had another idea, and this was an idea of a mage and a scribe. And so I kind of had this, the way the magic works is that um, a mage will cast magic with their hand. And because of that, they can't, like when they write, the handwriting won't stay on the page. So they need a scribe to help record all their spells down. Um, and so I tried to write that story and it, again, it like just kept fizzling out. It's like, I'm missing something. And I remember hearing Lainey Taylor one time say that writing a story is like, uh, making fire and you need two ideas to rub together. Um, so I was like, well, let me just bring these two I- random ideas together. Um, and once I did that, the story caught fire and I knew like it was going to be set more in an ancient setting. And I could kind of see like the sister's family that they lived on this ancient olive grove that had been in their family for generations. Um, And I began to kind of write the story out. And I also saw that they were descendants from um, a God who had fallen. So that kind of began to pull in my love of mythology, which I've always um, just been very drawn to. And I think Greek mythology especially is something that um, has really influenced a lot of our literature in general. And so, um, and I also had another book where, 
um, it was talking about armor. So the book's called Warrior by R.G. Grant, and he had a spread of hoplite armor. So I kind of did this really like intense research of like the armor, the you know the hoplites wore the foot soldiers because one of the sisters is a soldier. So um, I think I just kind of began to pull these pieces together of things like from the sisters out, like you know what are they interested in? You know, one sister's a soldier, the other sister longs for magic and doesn't have it, but can become a scribe. Um, and then also just kind of playing back on, um, you know, ancient Greece. Like I definitely did a lot of research on ancient Greece, like the clothes they wore, what they would, what they ate, what the weather was like, what the train was like, um, to kind of help me build my own world. Amazing. I love that. Yeah. That's so cool. I can't wait. I can't wait to read that one. Um, Adrian, your turn in the hot seat. So you write these big, um, space operas, these big science fiction novels. Um, how do you world build in space, right? There's this idea that this is uncharted territory. You can almost do whatever you want, but can you? Are there expectations that you think about from the reader? Um, what, how, how is your process from beginning to end when, you, when it comes to approaching these books? Yeah, um, so science fiction world building for me at least is quite different to fantasy world building because you're not starting with a blank page. You're um, depending on where you're putting the science sort of slider. You're, you're having to incorporate the real world to a greater or lesser extent. And certainly with um, the children of time novels and Doors of Eden, I've tried to work within the framework of known science to the extent that I understand it and have been able to research it and been advised by actual real scientists, which I am not and to the extent that it is known at all. And beyond that, you can kind of start making it up out of whole cloth, but you're still constrained by what seems plausible. So, um, you know, the multiple worlds uh, of the Doors of Eden are informed by sort of multiple world theory to a certain extent. And then of course you get to the, the fuzzy stuff and you can then steer it to where it is narratively convenient uh, in the same way as the, the spider evolution in children of time is something i discussed at length with actual sort of spider and and general arthropod specialists so that i was doing something that i felt an actual sort of arachnologist wasn't going to call me up on the moment the book got, got published because I, w I was very keen on honestly i think if you're doing something in detail about spider evolution in space you kind of have to try and get it realistic as possible because otherwise it is it is a fantasy novel at that point <laughs> and that wasn't what i was aiming for yeah do you ever give yourself do you allow yourself to have liberties because i almost feel like writing writing in space do you just i mean it's not like star wars science where there is no science right um but do you give yourself enough liberty to just have fun um i because like your process like right now it just sounds so stressful like uh, uh, waiting for everyone to check up on you and give you like an A in, in, in theoretical science, you know? I think that's, I mean, unfortunately, that's the way my mind works on my own mm -hmm. personal insecurities work. And I'm not recommending that necessarily as a mindset for other writers <laughs> approaching the same thing. But also, I, honestly, when you get it right, there is a real feeling of having, it's like, it's like having made a really good chair, basically. You've made something <laughs> and it's, it's solid and you can sit on it and it'll bear your weight and it'll bear in this case bear the weight of the story and you can still tell the story perfectly well but you kind of feel there you've done this you've done a really good job of craftsmanship on building this structure that doesn't sort of radically offend basic principles of, of physics or biology or whatever and it's a different exercise to uh, making a fantasy world or even making a more space opera side end um, science fiction world, which is something I've been doing more recently. But it's still, a, when you've done it, it's a, it's, it gives a very particular pleasure, I think, that you've made, you've actually crafted this thing to fit within the restrictions that you've been given. And often, and, and often I mean, it's one of the things, I, I, um, I used to belong to a writing group and we had um, every sort of, we do a story, but it was a story you have, you have to include certain things and comply by certain rules. And it, often it was surprising what you get when you're under those constraints that you wouldn't necessarily think of just purely left to your own imagination. I don't think I should ever be allowed to write 
uh, science fiction <laughs> because I think that I will fail because I'm like, why not? Um, in my world of the like bells, aliens, <laughs> right? In my world of the bells, people, uh, kids are great. They love the things that I've done. I've sort of shrunken all the animals to the size of teacups. I'm like, why not? But I don't really explain how that happened. The kids go with it, but the adults are like, but how do we have teacup elephants and teacup giraffes? Like, where is the science? I'm like, why? I'm like, why do we have to explain that? Or like, you get mail by post balloon. The balloons come through your window with your mail. They're like, but how? And I'm like, it doesn't matter. Um, so I should not be trusted um, with the tools of science fiction. I think that I would just make a mess of the genre. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think the one of the big things, I mean, especially for, for, more, for more fantastical worlds, but also just in general, it's as long as you have your, a consistent idea and tone and you're not, you, and you, know, you don't suddenly pull things out that were never hinted at or possible before because it's narratively convenient in the moment. It doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter. I think it's, I am, I am quite kind of ridden, as it were, by um, a scientific conscience. I have a scientific background academically and i kind of i kind of feel i owe it to science as some sort of weird abstract concept concept to get that right but a lot of that is purely my own hang-ups to be honest which is amazing and it segues to chris because i'm so curious you're doing uh science fiction for for this novel and i want you to talk about it and i want you to weigh in on these things because you have a big fantasy series and so building mm. the world of aragon i'm just wondering did you employ a different part of your brain different tools as you were building out this new landscape or was it the same i mean Yes and no. Uh, I, I would add in to what Adrian was saying that I think that people sometimes are much more willing to accept large leaps of logic than small ones. You really do have to pay attention to the, the things that people are familiar with and get those right if you expect them to accept the existence of faster than light travel or dragons. You know, if you are writing a fantasy novel and you describe a saddle in an incorrect way, the way someone is actually putting a saddle onto a horse, there are an awful lot of people who know how to put a saddle on a horse, and they're going to inform you in no uncertain terms that you have messed up. And mm -hmm. and that's going to interfere with their ability to enjoy all the larger leaps of logic. For myself, I'm I'm very much the same mentality as Adrian. When I wrote The Inheritance Cycle, I allowed myself exactly one leap of logic, one breaking of reality. And that breaking of reality was the assumption that uh, living things, conscious things, even, even perhaps plants to a degree, could directly control different forms of energy with their minds. And that was magic. And then from that point, I attempted to stick to physics as best I knew it and best I understood it. Uh, in making everything possible and to the point where when I was 16 I was using my high school physics uh, my high school math to figure out how much energy it would take to boil an average brain <laughs> and as it turns out you can you can boil brains almost all day long as long as you keep eating pretty regularly so <laughs> So with science fiction, uh, I actually didn't even want to do that. I mean, really, the only thing that was my leap of logic was faster than light travel. And in that case, I literally spent an entire year doing research because my, my, my scientific consciousness or conscience would not allow me to just say, oh, it works and not explain it. I had to figure out an explanation that fit with physics as we know it that would allow me to tell the story I wanted to tell. And that probably made things about ten times harder for myself than they really than it really needed to be, <laughs> but but again, as Adrian said, it resulted in in a structure for the story that's solid, and I can tell future stories with it, and it resulted in ideas for the world building and for ultimately for the story and the characters that I wouldn't have come across before that. And I I think ultimately that's the great thing about world building is that it really does give you new ideas. You, you go into it saying, hey, I wonder what if, or what about this aspect of my world? And before you know it, you end up in a place you never would have thought of before, and it gives your work unique elements. And you see that with everything from you know, Dune to you know, N.K. Jemisin to uh, a memory called Empire, you know, whatever, whatever works you want to look at, um, you know, the Doors of Eden, basically 
allowing yourself to do a deep dive on something that seems otherwise insignificant, nine times out of 10 will provide you with a little pearl, a little gleaming gem that's going to add something to your, your story. Yeah, that's, I, I think about that all the time when, when I go into regular fantasy research, because even though I may, I feel like I'm making all of this stuff up, it does the, the, the minute things that we think are like throwaway lines can sometimes be something really memorable for the reader. Um, but one thing I want to ask is, would you survive your own world? This world that you have spent all this time building <laughs> and creating, what are your chances? I mean, I know that in the world of my Brooklyn Brujas, I would just go to the, uh, I'll stay with the party king in, on the island and, and just like go to my, my supernatural nightclub and hang out. So I, in that sense, I'll probably will survive that and or die because vampires. But what about everyone else? Oh, this Rebecca. is a good question. <laughs> I, I think I definitely would. I think with sisters, like I would literally just stay in the Olive Grove and not leave. So I would just, <laughs> simple life. So <laughs> stay out of the action. But what about if you were to take the circumstance that you gave your characters, would that, would that affect anything? Or were, are you just like, no, nah, I'm good? <laughs> if I had to go on both of the sisters' journeys, I definitely wouldn't make it. I would, no. So... <laughs> I mean, um, I Doors of Eden is, is, is set in the real world in the modern day, and sometimes that feels touch and go, frankly. Um, if I actually got exposed to any of the um, general chicanery going on that affects the main characters, I would not last a moment. I mean, you, you get these sort of, oh, you know, in this historical period, who would you be? Would you be this king or this knight? And no, I'd be the dead guy who died of scrofula or something. And <laughs> I'm in no way equipped to survive any of the worlds that I create, frankly. Uh, well, if it were my fantasy world uh, in, in the inheritance cycle, I would be a literal god because, <laughs> because the world works off the basis of the concept of true names and words of power. And since I know all of the words and I invented all of them and I can invent more if I need to, I, I would be a total god there. If it were my science fiction universe, I'd I'd probably be dead inside of a week. So <laughs> uh, mainly, mainly, mainly because uh, magic doesn't exist and it uh, doesn't matter how smart or clever you are if you're on a spaceship that gets hit by a, a missile or a you know, high-powered laser, you're going to be eating, you're going to be breathing vacuum before too long. <laughs> I don't think I would exist in my world, the bells either, because I had probably, it has very much a French and New Orleans aesthetic and I would just eat everything and I'd probably end up getting food poisoning or <laughs> at some point and it deals with body modification and sort of magical sort of transformation. And I'd probably, my obsessions would get the best of me and I would just probably succumb to all of the, the evils of my own world. So I don't, I don't know if I have what it takes uh, to survive the world that I've, I've set up. Um, but it leads to a great sort of question about, we are world builders. We all use various tools to build worlds and experiences for our readers. And I'm wondering what other worlds that aren't created by you that you admire, that you would live in, that you, by content creator. So like, what are you reading? What are you, what worlds do you really love? And sort of tell me why. And the way that I asked you, what are the ingredients that you use to build? I like reading my peers and other writers to figure out, oh shoot, like how did they, how did they do this? How did they make me fall in love with their world? So tell me some worlds that you love and the why of that so that maybe our viewers can also read those, read those books along with yours. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I'll, I? Oh, no, you. Fine. I'll go for it. Um, I'd say uh, in terms of world building, I really enjoyed A Memory Called Empire, which just won the, I think, Hugo for best best novel of the year. Uh, I thought it was very interesting what it did with language and memory and, and all of that. Uh, I'm a big fan of Marie Brennan and her Natural, Natural History of Dragons series. Uh, Marie Brennan's actually, a, I believe she's trained with anthropology in, at Harvard, so she knows her stuff when it comes to world building. Uh, very, very clever. 
uh, of course, Ursula Le Guin, if we're going old school, and uh, and Dune. You know, Dune uh, created one of the more interesting universes to play in, and he and Frank Herbert did it in such a efficient way. If you actually read the book and look very carefully at how he builds his world, there's an awful lot that's sort of mentioned or implied, but he doesn't go on long tangents about how things actually work or, you know, the deep history of X or Y Z. And it's surprisingly successful. You know, he could have just confused the audience, but he didn't. So those are all. Yeah, I'd say those are those are some of the things I've been reading and some of the worlds I like. And and of course I read The Doors of Eden recently and uh all of the biology and deep history that uh Adrian came up with was quite enjoyable and very well thought out. Thank you. Um, amazing. I, Adrian, I, 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 yeah, I mean I I'm I'm a bit of a sucker for um a a, a fantastic a fantastical feeling world that still feels that that it's one where real people live uh and especially one where you've got that but you've also got the a certain fast and loose play with how real things are and a certain sort of surreal edge to it there's a book called the etched city by kj bishop which i absolutely love and really should be better known um which is set it's um has a a feel of a kind of central Mer american south american city and it's it's a kind of it's a sort of an urban fantastical drama and there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of magical elements but they're never very explicit and precisely how much is going on or in fact as the book goes on it kind of builds and builds until it becomes inarguable there is stuff going on but it's it's very very beautifully written but the it also at the same time feels like it's a city that people are living their everyday lives in and you get a similar thing with um Oh, uh, the Ambergris series, Jeff Andermere. Um, he, the, the city described there is very odd, and there's some crazy things going on literally beneath the surface. But at the same time, most of the protagonists are real people doing, trying to live real lives as reality kind of disintegrates around them. Amazing. Rebecca, to you, what are some worlds that you love and why? So um, I love the books of Pelennor by Alison Krogan. Um, this is a four book series and it's like, but like it's in the vein of Lord of the Rings, but if the main character was a young woman um, and of course, like I love Lord of the Rings growing up, but I definitely always wanted to see um, more of a female protagonist in Lord of the Rings. So this is, Alison is a poet. And so just the world building is incredible. And in the world, um, the wizards are basically bards. So she really ties in how music is in this culture and it's absolutely beautiful. Um, another book that I love is Uprooted by Naomi Novik. I love how just the sense of wonder in that book and like how the magic operates. It's not really explained all that much, but I still just was so captivated. I remember the first time I read it, just how the magic and the spells work. Um, and I also, you guys have mentioned N.K. Jemison. I actually just finished the fifth season this morning, and I'm still just like reeling from the epicness of that book. Um, I was just absolutely blown away by the world building and like how the characters tie into that world building. It was it's absolutely phenomenal. So I have the second book, so I'm like going to dive into the second one today. So those are three three of my favorites. Awesome. And those are amazing. We got a lot of very different worlds. And one world that I want to, I don't know if I'd ever survive it, but I want to visit is um, V.E. Schwab's uh, Shades of Magic series and her Londons. I would love to go through all of them, even Black London, even though it's a dastardly <laughs> dangerous place supposedly, um, because I'm very interested in sort of like these, this idea of layers layered cities and sort of what kind of magic and mischief you can find in that kind of fantasy world. Also, I love London and I'm so sad that we are quarantined here in America because of all the things and I can't be in, um, in uh, Europe and in London for the month of August, which is my favorite thing to do. So I would love to, to visit that world. I probably wouldn't survive, <laughs> but I would love to, <laughs> to check it out and to, um, to, to be a magic messenger and traveler and have a coat that I could wear in various, various Londons. Hell's coat is his own. Okay. <laughs> Fine. I'll steal it. 
<laughs> I think I would choose uh, Woven in Moonlight by Isabel Ibanez um, because, Rebecca, you were talking about the food in that book, and it's, it's also really, really beautiful. It's inspired by uh, the Bolivian politics of the Andes, and in, but in a fantasy setting. And, you know, I'm from Ecuador, so it is the closest thing I've ever gotten to uh, a, a, a fantasy written by somebody from, from the, you know, the continent. So I really, really love that. Um, final question is, what is the, like, your, the favorite thing of yours that you have created from your own world? You get one thing. That's it. <laughs> one item. One thing <laughs> from your world. Like, I know. It's like something, even I keep thinking of it like, you can, what if you could bring it into this world? You get the one thing oh, okay. that you can actualize from your world. Whoever's what ready, just go. Christopher, yeah, it better me. be a damn dragon. That's all I have to say. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Because if you do that dragon dirty, I'm going to be upset. Fine, but well, pa- pa- choose what part you of want. Me's, part of me is, t- is tempted to want to bring magic into the world because of just oh. what it would do for our, our, yeah. our species. But more realistically uh if i had to bring one thing into the real world favorite thing would be actually my uh markov drive which is my faster than light drive from my my new science fiction book because that would completely transform our civilization and um, our future as a species i'll bring your dragon (laughs) (laughs) you can always genetically engineer a dragon down the road yeah fine fine Rebecca, what do you want? You can bring something from your world into our world. One thing, what is it? Oh, gosh. Okay, so in Sisters, there are these relics that the gods left behind that um, have magic. So I'm going to bring one of the relics with me, and it's uh, a necklace that, when when worn, enables you to fly, because I've always wanted to fly. So I'm going to be, like, way more selfish than Christopher and just bring the (laughs) necklace for myself. Christopher's like, let's solve all the let's, world's yeah, problems. Christopher's like, let's fix society. <laughs> Adrian, what do you got? Okay, so rather than solving problems or being in the middle, I'm going to create problems. Um, I, <laughs> in, uh, so in the Doors of Eden, you have a, a number of parallel worlds on each of which evolution has taken a radically different turn. And in one of the earliest ones you run into, on one of my favorites, uh, the trilobites, uh, <gasps> instead of oh. appearing at the beginning of the Permian actually take over and through a fairly, I think, well thought through plan, they end up becoming immortal sort of spacefaring star god trilobites um, that are the sort of the size of a London borough. <gasps> and yeah, I'd bring those in because who doesn't want that? Uh, I, 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 I approve of that. In? What book is this in? This is this is the doors of Eden. This is okay. Okay, amazing. I've been you're trying to kill us all. <laughs> chaos. I love chaos. Zoraida, what are you bringing in? <laughs> um, I think I would bring in uh, an incendiary. I have these memory stones, which I guess like you could just take a picture. But memory stones are just they're so much prettier, and so you could have these like light up light up necklaces. Um, but then I would I would need also the the magic with which to be able to read them. Uh, so. I think that that would that's also pretty selfish, but I, I like this idea of having uh, an object contain the memory of a civilization, which obviously we have with computers, but uh, these are more a little bit more sacred. So I know that I would choose from your world, Danielle, but I'll let you. No, you can choose because I feel like my world is rotten. Rebecca Roanhorse describes it as a beautiful French tart filled with maggots. So I don't <laughs> think anything from my world. And if Rebecca Roanhorse tells you that, you know you're winning because yeah. her worlds yeah. um, are, are fantastic. fantastic. I would, <laughs> the teacup, the teacup elephants, the teacup animals. Yeah, That's I just feel I like. Bring. We shouldn't be trusted as a civilization to not mess with our animals, <laughs> to do that to them. But, you know, as long as people actually took care of them, I will take my little teacup animals. We can or bring you can them into bring our world. the post balloons and save the U.S. post office. Yeah, save the USPS <laughs> by having post balloons that you can send out of your own window. Um, and there'll be air postmen that will guide them along. And they're beautiful <laughs> and pretty and they float in your window. See? Science doesn't work, but and it's then, pretty. And then all the little boys with slingshots are going to hunt down the balloons. I know, oh my God. exactly. I know they would just shoot them out of the sky. Um, but you know what? 
Thank you so much for joining us and our Deadline City shenanigans and how we co-moderate for the magic of world building and submitting yourself to our line of questioning. Um, this has been such an amazing conversation and you all are brilliant, have brilliant brains and I hope everyone siphoned all of these good world building things so that they can fix their books. I know I need to fix mine. So um, thanks so much for joining us this morning or this afternoon, wherever you're tuning in. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Right on time. Thank <laughs> you.